One of the newer labs uh, that arrived at the uh, International Space Station was filled with fruit flies. Obviously, you might be asking why are we studying them when we already have humans in space. One of the answers, fruit flies, a model organism used in many research studies, and uh, we actually sent uh, 225 flies up to the space station to study at the same time, uh, where we can only send a couple of humans a year. Out at the Marshall Space Flight Center, our Lori Meggs visited the farm, if you will, uh, which is located out at the Ames Research Center, to learn a little bit more about raising fruit flies for space flight. Well, we're here down on the farm, but it's really not your average farm. I mean, there looks like a million fruit flies there. Is, is that what we're seeing? Tell yes. us what we do here on the farm. This is exactly what you're seeing. So this is where we breed the flies. So this is where we can get hundreds and hundreds of flies that we need when we do space flight experiments. And you know, if there's a scrub because of bad weather or something like that, and we have to fly the next day or the, the day after. You have a couple of extra. We have, yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. We have tons extra. But these aren't the same. They're all different kinds, right? Exactly. That's what I was going to say is these are also all genetically all different. So even though to you they all look like bottles of flies, <laughs> but these are genetically all different. And so let's say if there was one of these genetic lines that we were going to fly for space flight, we would take that and we would expand that stock to make many, many, many copies so that whenever we needed it, we were ready with young flies. So to make copies, we've got to feed them, and that's yes. what happens in here too. Exactly, exactly. So this stuff here that you can see is the food. And so what, you know, as you can see, it's, it's a lot of work. So what the team does is that they, they make the food. You have to give them food regularly. Unlike if you're working with, say, bacteria or yeast, and you don't want to work with them for a while, you put them in the freezer, and they're good to go. And then when you're ready, you come back and you revive them, right? You can't do that with flies. You have to constantly keep them alive and give them food till you're ready to use them. And then all these different genetic stocks are used for different kinds of experiments. That's what I was going to say. How do you decide, okay, it's this jar that's going now or this bottle that's going now? It's usually to do with the science question you're asking. So some of them, for example, may be important for studying how the heart functions. And so believe it or not, these flies have little hearts exactly like we do that beat and that have the same kind of regulation for the rhythm, for the heart rhythm. And so there are some mutants here where the, uh, the fly f heart function is altered just like they would be in a human, in a family, which had that particular mutation. Uh, similarly, there are mutations for the immune system, so the, the immune function may be impaired. Um, there's other kinds of mutations, for example, stress. So we have some called, uh, they're long-lived flies, so there's this one that we love that's called Indy which stands for I'm not dead yet, <laughs> because those flies actually live almost twice as long as their counterpart without this particular uh, gene change. And that's usually 30 days, right? Their lifespan is Is at least pretty, pretty 30 short. days, yeah. So once the adults come out, uh, meaning that from the egg to the adult is about 10 to 12 days, and then once the adult comes out, they can live anywhere from you know four to eight weeks, usually about six weeks. Um, but then the long-lived mutants can live two months almost. Wow. And, and I keep holding this, but, but yes. it's, these are breathable. I mean, it's not sealed. Exactly. So that's an excellent question. So yeah, these, bo the, these have actually living flies in them, as well as eggs, larvae, pupa, and the adults, which are all the life stages. And so they all need to breathe. And so these are, the co these are cotton plugs. They're compressed cotton. So what's neat is they allow airflow back and forth very well but yet they don't allow other infectious things or other bugs that you don't want in there to go in. So it's protective, but at the same time breathable. So we grow flies here all the time? We do, we do. In fact, we have to have a continual stock going. And so all of these, and you can, you can tell this would be too much work to do all in one day. And so basically the way we do it is, you know, folks in the lab on a weekly basis have to uh, feed. And mind you, what you're seeing here is only a subset. Inside these incubators, we have more flies as well. And so all of them need to be fed on a regular basis so they don't run out of food. Um, and so that we're ready for space flight when we need to, to fly these fly knots up into space.
What is the one thing that we really have learned from studying fruit flies in space? We've actually learned several things. Um, one of them, for, just to give you an example from the last experiment, is that we, um, the immune system of the fruit fly is affected by space flight, which you know, is not surprising in terms of we see that in humans and in other animals. We see indications of that. We also see that in flies. So then flies act as a good model to study the changes in the immune system in space flight. Um, we also find that there are changes in stress, which again, you know, happens to humans in space flight, as you can imagine. It's a pretty stressful environment. Um, it happens to fruit flies as well. And so what we learned from looking at their, um, their uh, physiology and their genetic changes after space flight is that there are these changes um, in oxidative stress. So you can study the mechanism by which the stress happens and what you can do to counter it um, with the flies um, in the future. Oh, another thing for, to give you an example is um, a group of scientists, uh, along with myself, but our collaborators, uh, Rolf Bodmer, Karen O'Core, Peter Lee, um, what we're looking at, we're also using the fly as a model to study cardiovascular function. So you can look at flies, look at heart function and how it's altered in space, and also have genetically engineered versions that have the same sorts of defects in heart function that the human population have. There are some mutants where, you know, if a family has it in the human population, they're predisposed to heart problems. The flies have families like that too. And so we study those in the space like context to understand, you know, what are the alterations? What can you do to try and prevent those? Um, and things like that. What do fruit flies eat? So fruit flies eat a mixture. It's, it's kind of a, it's a nutritious diet. There are two different kinds of diets that we have in the lab. There's this, this food that you see in the white color. Um, and then there's another one that we're using that we use for, uh, for a space flight that, that uh, Shopa was just working on, which is this blue color. We put this blue food dye in. But essentially, it's a mixture. There's agar to kind of hold shape, but there's cornmeal, there's sugars like dextrose and stuff. Uh, there's some yeast, you know, heat killed yeast that we put in, for, you know, to get proteins and vitamins and things like that. So it's a nutritious meal. Uh, that we and a, and a complete meal. Not enough provide. for me. I'm, I'm going to have to look in one of these refrigerators and see if there's anything else I can have for lunch. <laughs> More flies. <laughs>